here to listen to some fabulous speakers about the roots of Indigenous gardens. The program is brought to you through my organization, Rural Cap, along with our partners at the Tribes Extension. And without further delay, I'm going to turn it over to today's moderator, the fabulous teacher, Lisa Strecker, um, at the UF UAF Ethnobotany Program. Thank you, Emily, and thanks for the webinar, and especially thanks for all of you who came. It's spring out there, it's getting warm, and it's getting harder to sit inside. Um, so welcome to our webinar about Indigenous Roots of Gardening in Alaska. I've got a five slides of intro, um, and then I'll pass it over to our amazing panelists. So, but before I give you that introduction, I would like to introduce you to the highlights of the day, the two highlights of panelists who carved out time to join us and share the experiences, research results, and knowledge. Thank you so much to Mida DeWitt and Khalil English for being here. And I will let the panelists introduce themselves. Um, Khalil and, and Mida, just share who you are and what brings you here. Khalil, do you wanna get started? <clears throat> sure. Um... Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kolo English. I grew up here in Juneau, and I am a student with the UAF Ethnobotany Program. Um, and then I'm also an anthropology um, and Alaska Native Studies major at UAS. Uh, and I love plants and learning about plants from the people who have been working with them since time immemorial and have that deep relationship. And I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you. Mida. Excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, my English name is Mida Dewitt. I'm calling in from Denina Ethnena in Anchorage, Alaska. And I'm Shinget from Wrangell, but I also have family from Yakutat. And I am, uh, I'm in love with plants. I'm, I'm a bit of a plant nerd and um, somewhat obsessed over potatoes this year. And so I'm really happy to talk about them today. It was hard to condense. I wrote probably about 9,000 words about potatoes the other day. So this is my, my short version and I'm happy to be here. And I'm also excited to hear about your work, Julio, on silverweed because not a lot of people know about it. So I'm excited to... Um, just, you know, young people getting into plants and, and education is a good thing. Yeah, thank you both. So my name is Lisa Stryker. I'm the anthrop um, anthropology and ethnobotany mainly instructor at the Kaskokum campus in Bethel. And I can totally relate to potatoes and their love for them because I moved to Alaska from Germany 10 years ago and this is where I'm culturally from. So potatoes, that's almost like very close to my heart. Um, Thank you. So I have, again, as I said, only a few slides because our panelists have so much to share. I want to stress that gardening is an integral part of Alaska Native cultures, although that is not very well known or understood. And in order to change the situation, we decided to have today's webinar. Gardening here is defined as tending to plants, supporting their growth and well-being in order to be able to harvest parts of them or the entire plant. Depending on their cultural and regional context, these gardens look very different. So, we need, so what is a garden, right? We need to understand our current lack of knowledge about indigenous plant cultivating and management practices in historical and ongoing colonial contexts. The very first step of colonizing a new land and that is dispossessing and physically removing people from their lands was to disconnect people from their resources, which then led to the loss of plant related knowledge and practices, obviously, right? Conveniently, the newcomers dismissed the indigenous people's land management practices because they didn't match their understanding of agriculture, which was also a Eurocentric marker for land ownership. Consequently, so-called uncultivated land was labeled wasteland and open for grabs. And that's exactly what happened. Most of the, the available historical accounts stem from a white men who were part of the colonial endeavor, and they saw and documented what they wanted to see, wide expanses of untouched land. And it is thanks to the work of scholars from the indigenous and academic communities who, 
thanks to them, we now have evidence, at least for the Canadian Northwest Coast and Southeast East Alaska, that most of what is commonly perceived as natural, so-called wilderness, untouched environment is actually man-made. The estuarine gardens of Southeast Alaska and British Columbia have been relatively well studied and it is still in progress. However, documentation about practicing practices of actively taking care of the plants and the land they grow on are still very sparse for the rest of Alaska, which again, doesn't mean they didn't or don't exist. It rather reflects the cultural prejudices, gender bias and academic agendas that were part of the colonial project. And this is where we all have to step in as these powers are still at play as we can currently see unfold in the state-driven privatization of public lands, which is subsistence land in Niniana, the Totkacheka project. So it's, it's still happening. And here this beautiful photograph, I did not have the chance to ask the lady if she agrees, so I apologize, <laughs> um, but um, I have the, the photo credit that was came with the publication. So the next, the other aspect of it is that Alaska Native communities also have a tradition of gardening that was originally inspired by European style gardens. It is not, again, very well known that informal family and community gardens were common in villages of interior Alaska, at least since the end of the 19th century. So that's quite a while. These so-called outpost gardens supplemented the subsistence harvest with potatoes, turnips, rutabagas, and other crops. Depending on the cycle of other subsistence foods and activities, these gardens are more or less intensely cultivated. But again, they were part of the lifestyle, the culture, and everyday life. So, and again, this is we're on my last slide here. Now, when promoting and supporting ag in rural Alaska, it is essential to honor the original ancient roots of plant stewardship and cultivation instead of perpetuating the policies that were also thrown at Alaska Native villages to develop agriculture to overcome a perceived shortage of food and get them on, onto the train of being productive in the mindset of economic development, which also has a longstanding tradition and people truly don't need that anymore. So um, with that being said, this was a whirlwind introduction. Thank you all for coming and to learn more about the many things that we don't know and about, about Alaska Gardens. So thank you. And I would like to pass it on to Khalil to give us his introduction of what he learned about silverweed, which is a very special project. And I'm excited to have you here. Thank you, Khalil. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, let me get the screen shared. Okie dokie, move this thing out of the way, play. So um, for one of my projects this semester in ethnobotany, I looked at silverweed, um, which are these lovely compound leaves you see in the background. Um, and as I mentioned here, it, silverweed is kind of all around the world. Um, and even though it's such a small little herb that I have overlooked many, many a times, it um, holds a really important place all around the world. Um, so in Tlinget, it's known as Tzait. Um, and it's, as I said, native to much of the, uh, the temperate north. And you can see the range down there at the bottom. Um, and all along that range from the northwest northwest coast of uh, North America to the northwest coast of Europe, um, and then especially in the Tibetan Plateau, uh, it's a very important food. Um, it grows food? the silverweed. Yeah, it, it is um, actually really good. I'll, I'll get to how uh, it tasted towards the end um, and share my experience with cooking and eating it. Um, but it is also one of the earliest foods, um, earliest in regards to a European calendar. The Tlingit calendar begins with the, the salmon in the summer. Um, so for the European calendar, it is the earliest food. As soon as the snow melts, you can go out and gather these roots. So here's a photo of one of the locations that I gathered these roots at. Um, and you can see them mixed in with some other culturally significant plants such as yarrow, and um, a wild parrot uh, whose scientific name is Carniocelinum gamolinii. Um, these all growing together in community within the salt marsh. 
So this is just a line drawing to give you a, a more clear understanding of what they look like. The specific species we're looking at is this one here on the left, um, P. and Serena, um, the Pacifica. So in uh, Southeast Alaska, we're, Southeast Alaska and like Northern British Columbia as well, our focus will be today for this. Um, but the best silverweed, according to elders, is found in sunny locations along the salmon bearing stream. So they're well fertilized, they get all their needs, um, and they're very easy to grow outside of the salt marsh as well. They're able to deal with a wide range of habitats. Um, I think part of that is that they're often growing in great abundance in these salt marshes, which makes them a halophyte. They can deal with very um, harsh conditions. Uh, they can deal with heavy soils, they can deal with light sandy soils. And all along the Pacific Northwest um, were these estuarine gardens. And I had never heard of these before outside of um, estuarine gardens for shellfish. But uh, according to elders, uh, again, a lot of the anth anthropological texts I found focused on Vancouver, um, Vancouver Island, and um, along British Columbia. Uh, but elders said that there was never a single plot of that shoreline that was not in active cultivation. So I have this um, little line drawing again here at the top to kind of show you this is the the top section is the normal range um, and kind of change of species as you work your way down from above the salt marsh down towards the water. And you can see that the edible rhizome area with the potentilla is pretty small. Um, but if you go and you engineer the salt marshes and allow the soil to and sediments to come together up against a point, um, so like rocks in front of the ocean side, that soil builds up and it becomes very loose um, as people are working with it. So these, as you see in the bottom two, are examples of gardens that were um, taken care of in the past. Uh, again, these are in BC. But these gardens would have been very, very integral to uh, social status as well. Um, they would have been owned by the person with the highest social status and then broken down by families. And then within the family, you would kind of divide that plot. So it was manageable for each person. Because um, these were, like I said, very intensely managed areas. Um, what I was reading is that people were going out to weed and to fluff the soil throughout the season. Um, and I'll get into this a little bit more in talking about the salt marsh, but um, this is especially important with the way that the salt marsh becomes layered due to the ecosystem. You'll end up with um, very segmented sections of um, organics and thicker soils at the bottom. So by mixing these together, it made a much more productive habitat for the roots, um, not just to grow bigger, but also to grow more straight and to be more easily taken out of the salt marsh. Um, and then I'll add a little bit about uh, Southwest Alaska here. As far as this mouse food at the bottom, uh, I don't have any photos, but um, this is that food extending further north. Uh, they, um, in Southwest Alaska, were able to figure out that you can kind of snag them from the voles. The voles do this great work of gathering all the roots. And if you lift up a vole catch, it's full of roots. Uh, after harvesting them myself, the voles do an incredible job. And I wish I was nearly as efficient. Um, and then I'll read this quote. Let me move the, the screen. So although the scientific community has given little recognition to these practices, it is apparent that the peoples of the Pacific Northwest Coast, at some point in their history, learned to harness the productivity of one of the world's most biologically productive environments, the temperate salt marsh. Um, this is an important note, I suppose, that gets brought up often is, um, even though the scientific community has given it little recognition, um, this is also an issue with the anthropological text. Um, 
I will get into that after I jump into some conjecture, but um, like Lisa mentioned, there's a reason that we don't have a lot more information, especially up here in Tlingit Ani. So this is a map um, of Juneau and surrounding territories. And then the images on the left are from a hike that I did around the backside of Douglas. So this location is an old village site um, for the Takukwan. And I happened to notice it was really, really densely full of suktaik, which is goose tongue. And um, this Lysimachia maritima, these are both important cultural foods and they're surrounded uh, on the edge by these high banks, which uh, improve and um, enlarge the habitat that they're able to grow in. Um, so I'll quickly show you a little map. Uh, let's see, how do I get of that area? I am not sure that it has been um, set up by people intentionally, um, but I kind of wanted to highlight the way that this information can change the way that you see land um, and kind of the way that if you don't have that background at all, like maybe some of these an anthropologists could overlook things. I find that hard to believe with the amount of in intensity that people were working with these lands and the importance and the festivals that were held just for these foods. Um, but you can see this is the stream and you can see if you follow that stream, there are a lot of um, large sandbanks above, and you can kind of see that light green within. Those sandbanks are just kind of holding the habitat um, for the suctate. And this is sort of the idea we're getting into with um, silverweed or zate. Um, so onto the horticulture of it. If anyone has read Breeding Sweetgrass, she presents. Um, in one of her chapters, the idea of our interactions with the land as bolstering the productivity of the land, um, or you know, just being a part of the land, uh, a natural process of the land, and did two studies looking at how breeding grass or sweet grass was harvested. Um, most important for us is just that the harvesting, the act of harvesting and interacting with the sweet grass allow the sweet grass to proliferate. This is the same sort of thing that you find with silverweed is when humans are interact interacting with this plant and they're weeding the area and fluffing the soil, the roots can get very large and they can go straight down, which um, were very prized and given to those of higher status, the large thickest roots. Um, but then as soon as you stop, these soils can get very, very boggy and heavy. And this is what I experienced when I was pulling the roots up. Um, as far as the texts and the amount of information relating to this form of gardening within Tlingit Ani, um, what I read was that this would have been a task performed mainly by women. And as we know, men were not paying attention to what women did uh, almost intentionally. So sadly, some of that is gone um, or just isn't written down. Um, and then just to bring in Europe, because I don't, one thing that is very unique to me about this plant is that um, for anyone wanting to connect with those, those foods of their ancestors, this kind of reaches a lot of people. And in the British Isles during the potato famine, a lot of people returned to silverweed. Um, it was even called the seventh bread of the Gales. So finding silverweed, um, is not necessarily difficult. Finding a good place to harvest the silverweed is a different story. Um, so in Tlingit culture, you would have a cut. Um, I didn't find exactly what it was made of uh, here because there's no yew, but at least a little bit further south, it would have been made out of yew. And it was just a big uh, wooden digging spoon to get the zate out with. Um, they would have then been dried and um, braided or matted for storing. Apparently, this also made them taste a lot better. It helped them to become more sweet. Um, uh, after about two to three months. Um, and so I'll show you now where I went to go gather this silverweed. You can see uh, 
two different soil types here. Uh, the one on the left is the wetlands and the one on the right is coming from Fish Creek, uh, which is another important site um, for the Taku Flinget. Um, and before I could harvest these and during, I, during harvesting these, because I did return to the site, something that kept coming up for me was the issue of contaminated soils. Um, so if you're concerned about a plant uptaking like heavy metals um, or something like that, roots are gonna be the main culprit often. Um, so that was really important to me. Uh, there's also Juno, you know, we're in a fjord and we've altered the shoreline to be able to fit people between the edge of the mountains and into the ocean. So downtown, you can see here on the right, we don't have the same tideland habitat that we used to. Um, more conjecture, I'm curious to know if this would have been somewhere that was gardened. Um, definitely is no longer as uh, productive as it would have been. Um, skip this because we're all from Alaska here and you understand the context. The only uh, bit I will add is that the Taku Inlet was spoken of as a very good site for silverweed. My guess is you can see these flat areas that those would just be heaven for silverweed. So looking for those salt marshes in Juneau and thinking about how people are using the soil, um, this is a NOAA map just to highlight where the salt marshes are. And you can see they're all around the airport and then a little bit to the right of the airport, you can't see as well, but that is where the dump is. Um, neither of those are putting things into the soil that I really wanna eat. That only leaves a little bit of space after that. Um, so I still went out to get some from the wetlands anyway. I attempted to move off to the edge and stay away from where I thought the largest concentration of whatever could be in the soil was. Um, you can see it's pretty mucky, but this is the sort of habitat you're looking, you would be looking for. And you can see the snow is still within um, the little ravines. This is, as soon as the snow has melted, you can get out there and get these roots out. Um, and then I will just scoop one. Yeah, so you can see here, uh, getting into the roots it, without any experience. Luckily, um, I you get to be guided by the silverweed itself. The, the leaves persist into the winter and they persist with full form, the color changes, but full form. So I was able to grab the top of the leaf and kind of follow it back. And it um, it comes back to a base where multiple leaves radiate, radiate out from. And then there's a little bit of plant starting to sprout. And you can kind of see that at the end of my tool here on the left. Um, and here it is a little bit closer. And then on the right, where the leaves are coming in together. So this is what I was looking for to identify the silverweed um, from scratch. And um, again, you can see that the soil is very mucky. It made a good suction cup noise when I got into it. Um, let's see, So the second place I ended up going to, because this ended up being so thick and boggy, the roots were not as big. Um, and I did return a second time and I found trash strewn along every section of the wetlands. Uh, so I went here to Fish Creek, um, Angukhaye, um, and this place had very nice soil. Um, I also harvested another project from here, so I was very excited about it. The only problem was this does not fit the criteria of being a sunny location. So I'll get into that when we get to the tasting. Um, there's the silverweed, there's the silverweed. So once you pull the roots out, this is coming from Angukhaye, the fish creek. So on the left, you can see um, very thin roots and they're kind of darker in color. Um, will this video go while I speak? No, oh, maybe not. Um, there was a video of me, oh, there we go. So um, I like to rinse my materials outside because I mean, we saw the dump. It'd be weird if I took something from next to the dump and put it in a trap bag and then uh, brought it back to the dump. Um, but so I gathered the roots, I washed them in the creek, 
And um, this is what they look like rinsed. These are specifically the ones from uh, Fish Creek. You can see they're a little bit thicker. Uh, these versus the first ones were actually very hit and miss. Um, I spoke to a friend who has experience with these and she said it probably was that this is not a sunny area. Um, but the ones that came from the wetlands where I am concerned about what was in the soil were delicious. Um, they are nutty, they have no bit of stringiness to them. They're an incredible source of starch uh, within the British Isles or I think uh, just that whole area of Northwest Europe. You, you have this and you have burdock. Um, and then when it comes to the Northwest, um, what Mira will get into is you have uh, the Klinga you have potatoes, and then you have this. Um, uh, yeah, sweet, nutty, like a nutty sweet potato. And this is sort of what the um, elders were saying in their interviews. So the way to eat them was with tsa e, which is seal oil. I don't have seal oil. So I had made some uh, basil oil and I used that instead. Um, and they go really good together. I did get to try it with seal oil later, um, thanks to Yaro, uh, Yarovara, and that was very good. So the cooking time is very important with these. Uh, again, with the interviews I was reading, the way to know that they are done is the new, they start dancing kind of like worms. Uh, it's pretty fun to watch. Um, and then they're the perfect texture. Before you can eat them raw, um, they got a kind of crisp snap, but there's a little bit more of that astringency and a little bit more of that bitterness if you were to have it raw. Um, oh, skipping ahead too far. Um, and yeah, so I guess that that was my experience going out and finding the silverweed and then tasting it myself. And I was taken aback by how good they are and how international they are. Um, there's also a movement I forgot to mention with, again, them being all around the world. In Tibet, uh, they're trying to get, trying to reintroduce this food um, to children in order to fulfill all of their protein needs because um, it fits in with whatever else it is uh, that they're eating to get all of those essential amino acids. So I am now trying to grow these out. Um, I suppose I should have said in my introduction, I work at the Jensen Olsen Arboretum, um, so I'm lucky enough to be able to put things in the ground uh, as I want when my manager approves it and we will be building a bed of just silverweed and kuch, the um, rice root. And so when you harvest these traditionally, you break off the roots and you leave a piece of the root in the soil. That will regrow. Um, I was curious to see how well that happens, how quickly that happens. And so here is an example. Um, going from the 25th of April on the left to the 16th of May, so yesterday, uh, on the right. And you can see there are very little tiny shards of root on the left, and they're all sprouting really nicely. Um, I do imagine that these will stay in these pots for at least another month, probably two months, before I feel comfortable potting them out um, or picking them out and putting them into soil where they could get munched by other things. Um, but for those wanting to bring silverweed into their garden, you can take one plant and make many plants. You can put this plant in heavy soils. You can put this plant in drier soils. You can, it's, it's very adaptable. Um, and yeah, it's delicious. And, um, that is my presentation. Thank you so much, Khalil. I just love watching it every single time. Okay, away. So have you a, a couple of um, just maybe tips nerding out here. So when you harvest uh, next time, I want you to look for the banks that have more sandy loamy soil because you literally can just pull them out in a clump. Okay. Like it's so easy. It, and it's like really satisfying because you go spend hours digging up the roots and then you can just pull as many out in like two minutes. You're like, yeah. our elders really knew what they were doing. <laughs> well, have you done that in Juno? 
Um, yeah, actually, last time I did that, I was out the road. Vivian Work had her plant class um, that was out at the Methodist camp. And then there is the beach shore on the other side with some road erosion and sandy loamy soils. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Out by Eagle Beach and such. Sweet. I will have to go check that out. Yeah, thank you. It's always great to, that's what we're here for, right? For the plants and to nerd out over them. Um, you have questions in the chat, but I would just, just looking at the time, encourage you, Mina, to continue. And then we can simultaneously maybe respond in the chat or okay. just keep, keep them to the end. No, that's, I encourage people to ask um, questions to Khalil in the chat. Um, and I will get started. Yeah, thank you. Helps if I hit the right that's that show. Okay, so I, I did my traditional introduction. Um, also something of note is I was able to organize the Alaskan Plants as Food and Medicine Symposium for many years, um, did the first organizing of it in 2012 and brought together people from all over the state to help rematriate our traditional plant knowledge um, because it was dwindling for the many reasons that Lisa had stated earlier today. Um, and I was able to organize the Alaskan Plants as Food and Medicine Symposium for four or five years and then have been teaching regionally around the state of Alaska every year for over 10 years, um, as well as in Yukon, Canada, Washington, Oregon, and Montana. Once you get to the east side of the Rockies, my knowledge dwindles though. Um, and with that said, one of the plants that I had noticed that was significantly underrepresented was actually our, um, our traditional complex carbohydrates. And so that's something that I started teaching about on a regular basis. So um, thank you for talking about the silverweed and the seeds, I know, seed. Um, and I will talk about Kuntz, but I'll mention those a little bit. So this is my family and I always wanna um, just show my grandmas and great grandmas and um, mention to my teachers. I'm not going to be reading every single word on these slides, especially for recorded content. I like having words on there. People can pause and read it for themselves or refer back to it if they want to. Um, but just to you know, highlight uh, indigenous people and seeing that people have been practicing stewardship of the ecosystem for several thousands of years, well over 10, 12, 14,000 years, more like 24 plus thousand years. Uh, using traditional knowledge and practices to ensure the sustainability of our ecosystem and the well-being of our communities. And so one of the things that um, also kind of wasn't mentioned quite a bit, hold on one second. Sorry, my puppy has a bone in the background and it's super loud. Um, so one of the things that also kind of got minimized um, as mentioned earlier by Lisa is our gardening practices. And so that's been uh, the work that I've been doing as well for many years. Uh, this is a garden that is now in the Heritage Center. And I just popped a couple of slides in here because you were talking about uh, growing the silverweed. It grows quite fine. It loves to take over. It loves to be loved along with our other traditional plants. Um, they are not finicky, they're extremely hardy and grow well. And so this is a structure that was broken um, at the Heritage Center. And so uh, we reclaimed it. And symbolically that reclamation was like reclaiming our culture and our heritage. So this is, um, when we built it, there's the three rounds, the inner circles are um, the living world, you know, the human world, and we have the natural world and we have the spiritual world and those things that protect us. Uh, this in this jar is actually silverweed and masu or tzatz um, in oil for storage. So it's one of the ways that we stored some of our root vegetables. Of course, growing food creates a sense of self-sufficiency and boosts self-confidence. Uh, this is my plant bug. He's been learning how to teach um, college students and interns with me and present um, since he's 10 years old. So he's quite confident in, in that process. And as a Shlingat person, uh, 
oration or or speaking public speaking as a cultural value of ours and so by being able to teach about plants it helps to develop that as we've even just seen with Khalil and, and the pride in talking about his research with the silverberry I mean silverweed excuse me so Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium found that communities that utilize traditional plants have a higher intake of nutrient dense food and engage in higher physical activity levels. Uh, it underscores the nutritional value of natural plant based foods used for generations by our communities. People who use Alaskan plants also experience improved mental health due to our connection to culture and environment and increased self sufficiency. I'm going to take that bone away from the dog, so give me one second. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> I don't know if you could hear it, but it was driving me crazy. Um, so simple versus complex carbohydrates. Many of you know, but some of you don't know, a simple sugar is easily uptake by the body and creates a, a blood sugar spike and then drop. And because they're single or um, double molecules, a monosaccharide or a disaccharide, they don't carry nutrition with them versus the complex carbohydrate, which has three or more sugars that are linked together known as polysaccharides. They actually carry with them nutrients, vitamins, minerals. You know, they, when they're super complex or inulin, they're fiber and um, your body actually has to work to cleave off those sugars. And so it's really important to recognize what are our actual you know, fiber and complex carbohydrates in the state. There's many more, but I just highlighted the clinket potatoes, silverweed, chocolate lily, which is the rice lily root, or um, I'm gonna slow down here. We also have fireweed and hedysarum alpinium. And I'll talk about those more in a little bit, but it just shows, you know, 2.2 per 100 grams for fiber in the potato, 4.3 per 100 grams for silverweed, um, 19.9 per 100 grams for chocolate lily bulbs. Our fireweed roots have 2.5 grams per 100 grams. And then the rock star is, oh my gosh, our Indian potato, which is not the same thing as the clinker potato. But the Indian potato, the Hedysarum alpinium, has 20 grams per 100 grams of fiber. So just so you know what they look like for identification purposes, this is Sats or Hedysarum alpinium, or Indian potato. Um, this is that one that was just shown with the super high fiber, also like sunny estuary areas with high sandy loamy soil. A little bit drier than the silverweed though. This right here is our kuch or rice lily bulbs. Those are also easy to grow and prolific. Um, they just take a little bit of time. They're easily transplantable but they're also one of the first plants to die off. So you have to learn how to identify and find them in this form right here when they're um, dried out. And when we actually cultivated these estuaries, there's stories of these roots being the size of like a baseball or a tennis ball. You know, there's stories of, you know, pulling out long roots of um, the silverweed or the clinket potato, I mean, the um, Indian potato. And so by us aerating that dirt and mixing the nutrients and, and creating a looser soil, they were all actually able to grow larger. So the amount of time it took to harvest these seed you know, bulbs, these pellet bulbs, um, it, it wasn't even enough for really a whole meal. It was enough for maybe a taste from everybody. But we used to harvest them and they'd be the size, like I said, of a tennis ball or a baseball and even grind them up and mix them with seal oil and make camp bread or or fire um, bread. So here's a silverweed sate. I'm not gonna talk about this too much because it was just gone through. The only thing I think I might add is um, we you know, ate the roots, but the leaves are also medicinal and the leaves are used, they have molecules like a green tea and they're a diuretic. So they're used for health and wellness. Um, one of the medicinal uses for this plant also is an astringent for the intestines. So uh, leaky gut syndrome, you know, bleeding in the intestines, any of those issues, this is a plant that you could use for that. Um, so kuntz, right, potatoes, and I only have 20 minutes, but there's a lot to cover. So um, this is a clinket or haida potato. They're also grown by the Taltan, and we'll get into that a little bit more. 
Um, the potato, some of you may know, hopefully most of you may know that they originated in the Andes in South America around 8,000 years ago and introduced to Europe, not until the mid 1500s. And then they became a staple crop for the European countries, including um, obviously Ireland and Scotland as well. Uh, potatoes are an indigenous agricultural crop, first cultivated by the Inca Indians in Peru. And then they use the potato for food and medicine and develop sophisticated storage methods and propagation methods. So potatoes are nutrient dense. Um, the USDA actually classifies them as a vegetable and, and they are a plant and a vegetable, even though I always classify them as a starch when I'm cooking meals. Um, but their nutrition is significant, you know, 110 grams uh, calories, two grams of protein, 26 grams of carbohydrates. We have the fiber as we talked about earlier. Uh, they also have 620 milligrams of essential mil uh, minerals, and they also are high in potassium, which um, is, there's a movement to get more potassium into our diets because of its health benefits, high in vitamin C. They also have many vitamin B, like thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, B6, and folate. They're all critical for energy metabolism, maintaining heart health and brain health, which also affects our mental health. So potatoes are good for your, your mental health as well. Um, rich in antioxidants, in particular vitamin C and anthocyanins. So those actually protect the body from chronic disease um, and inflammation. There was a um, just an assumption that we got the potato from the Russians or the Spanish or the Americans. And we always asserted that we traded for them um, and that we got them from Central or South America. And so they did some genetic testing on it and they found that indeed the Clinket and Haida potato is unique and never went to Russia, Spain, or Europe. It came from um, you know, the, the Andes region up to um, Alaska. We have another potato, which was traded for through the trade routes to our Southern partners um, down, you know, just down the coast. But these ones were actually brought up from Central America in our canoes. So this is basically what I was just talking about with the potato coming from um, the Bolivia area with a unique variety that's grown there. And we actually cultivated it specifically and adapted it for Southeast climates. Um, part of our traditional agricultural practices, our farming or, or gardening practices, is that we um, we had storage for them, you know, and they throw, like, like I said, we cultivated them to thrive in cool and wet conditions. They're also pest resistant. Uh, deer don't chew on them. They're disease resistant. They're rot resistant. And um, we also used them in our process of our semi nomadic migrational routes between winter camp and, and fish camp. And we had, of course, those Southern facing hills, like Cleo was just talking about, um, where it got a lot of sun, but also, you know, there wasn't pooling water. So it shed the water, which we have plenty of water in Southeast, um, just to keep the soil moist. We would plant them with the eye facing up and towards the sun, and of course, cut them up and plant them in the spring. And then we would come back on our fall trip to back to winter village and dig them up. And there's stories of up to 800 pounds of potatoes being dug up for just one family to keep. Each family had their own gardening plots. Um, there was also a, a really healthy respect for people's uh, gardens, for their personal property, for their intellectual property, a heavy respect. So you didn't have to worry about people pilfering your garden or pilfering your winter community when you were gone, uh, because that was just an ingrained principle in the culture. Uh, the natural fertilizers that were generally used was herring placed in a barrel to rot, and also the use of kelps or seaweeds that were placed directly into the garden beds. Uh, we also maintained our garden areas through cultural burning. So in the winter, you would just, you know, the willows that are growing up or anything brush that's growing up, you burn it in the winter and it opens, it keeps that open uh, meadow like sun. And it also, the ash fixes the pH in the ground. So our berries love it. It's good for our potatoes. 
Um, it helps to keep the environment healthy. We also would, you know, burn in the winter um, infested trees or different things that were diseased um, and also to open up spaces. So tools, the favorite tool used for the clink potato or the kuntz is the digging stick. It has a pointy end and a forked end and it was used because it was um, efficient and it didn't dig up the landscape terribly. So it was continually being able to use an aerate and that digging stick was actually used for all of our root uh, plants that we harvested. Uh, it was also used as a ceremonial tool and decorated as such. Uh, for us, there isn't a difference between living functional tools and spiritual ceremony, like life is ceremony. And so you see that in all of our tools being adorned or decorated with story and, and, and pictographs. So we had uh, intentional potato sellers, and they were um, made specifically for storing the potatoes. They were underground storage pits that were cool and dark. And they put a layer of damp soil on the bottom and then layered on top of the potatoes to keep them in a dormant stage until it was time to plant in the next spring or to eat in the middle of the winter. Our trade routes, um, let's see here what time. All right, I'm going a little fast, but I wanna get through all of this pretty quickly. So my apologies. Uh, our trade routes, some of you may have heard of our grease trails. We had, not only did we have thousands of miles of nautical trade routes, we also had thousands of miles of, of land trade routes. And we traded people with people all the way up north into the Arctic, um, which is funny because I've said that before. And some people kind of, you know, they look at me like I'm making it up for some, you know, whatever. But there's ways that we can prove it. Uh, one of them, you know, the Gwich'in people are the most northern Dene people in the United States. And they uh, grew a clinket potato we traded with them. And their name for it. Uh, is one that translates to stranger's potato, reflecting the crop, crop's origin outside of their traditional territory and the cultural exchange with the neighboring group. And it's very important to recognize that this happened pre-contact. So not only were we cultivating, maintaining, you know, hybridizing, we were also you know, sharing it with our neighbors and, and using it as trade. Uh, intellectual property is a big part of it. Um, so sourcing clinket or Haida potatoes for your garden, it's challenging to get them, or it has been in the past. It actually took me two years to finally get a hold of some. Now you can get them from Sitka tribes um, or other uh, sources. And I got mine from, um, one set was from Steve Johnson and his family had cultivated them. And another one was from Eleanor Hayden uh, and her family had cultivated them. And I started out with 10 potatoes and I grew them two summers just to propagate. Actually, we didn't even eat a whole meal. We just taste, got to taste them because I wanted to keep the seed potatoes. And then this year I started cloning. So now my, like I've been overrun with clones. I have like a thousand plus potato plants and I don't even know where I'm gonna put them all. So I'm gonna give some of them away. Um, but this is such a hardy plant this potato plant, like I had one bucket that had uh, little mushrooms growing in it. So I was like, well, I'll lose this one. And I stuck it outside and it was still cold. This was like a month ago. It didn't even die. It didn't even wilt. It didn't even like back off. It got darker and stronger when I stuck it outside. I didn't even like heart bring it in and out to harden it. I just like was like, well, I guess you're going to die. <laughs> and the potato says, oh, heck no, I'm not. <laughs> Um, so I have all, all my little sprouts, if they even have one little root, they're all outside in the back, um, hardening off right now, getting ready to be planted. Uh, and I'm not even through with all my clones. I, I have, I'm probably only halfway through with the plants that I have now. So I'm excited. These can get quite large and bushy. Um, one of the things, if you're going to grow potatoes, and I don't necessarily have a slide for this is you don't want to have other potatoes flowering close to your potatoes because then you get a cross hybridization that happens. Um, so if you want to keep your potatoes you know, strictly, then you use either the cloning method or the seed potato method and you, you pop the, the flower buds off of them. Um, so here is 
the potato after I harvested it last year, uh, these did not, I didn't wait till the leaves died and it frosted because the skins will get thicker and it will get little thicker spots on it, uh, mostly because I was traveling and I didn't want to leave and um, not be able to harvest them. I was afraid of losing them. So it was more important just to harvest them early, but they're per pearlescent and they're beautiful and they're sweet and they almost have a buttery flavor to them. Um, traditionally, you know, a favorite way to eat them is with seal grease. And you'll hear that a lot with many of our roots. Why? Because it's important to mix good oils and fats with the fiber. Otherwise you can get bound up. Um, fat can, too much fat and grease and meat can bind you up too much, you know, um, fiber can bind you up. So if you mix them, then it helps create a, a perfect scenario for good motility. Okay. I basically was like speed reading through that, uh, but I wanted to get to the point of being able to have some conversation and dialogue and answer some of the questions. Yes, I, please go ahead. Yeah, Khalil, please. I was going to admire your potatoes because I grew some of the Haidas and um, mine are not nearly as beautiful as pearly as yours. <laughs> <laughs> and to see so many growing at once because it really is so hard to find them and find someone who's growing them to share with other people. Yeah, thank you, Khalil. And so these um, are intentionally going into, well, my garden. I'm going to give some back to Eleanor Hayden because she needs more. And then some of these are going back over to the Alaska Native Heritage Center it's because they're expanding in a healing garden. And then some of these are also going to the Alaska Native Head Start program. Um, so that's, you know, it's very shinget to share. That's what we do. And that's how we take care of people. That's beautiful. Oh, hi, Tia. Hi. Yeah. Oh, hi. Thank you, um, everyone, for all of your presentations. And Mita, I was going to ask. Um, I know you focused on the the Haida potatoes and the um, I think it potatoes, but have you been had any luck with transplanting the um, the mass food, the wild potato? Yeah. Yeah, it's easy. It's easy to seed and it's easy to transplant. Um, I I have seeds downstairs and I have like a 95% germination rate with the seeds and they're they're ooski, tiny and they're cute. Um the the plant themselves, I harvest them. So the traditional way is similar to the silver leaf, where when you harvest the musu plant, you leave. It says two centimeters, but I like two inches of root, the tuber, okay. and you can just chop off the rest of it. And and I, it's actually you can be somewhat rough with them. Um, I just you know with my garden spade chop it off and then stick it back in the ground. And it what it will do is it'll grow a whole bunch of little tubers like legs off of that main one. So it actually keeps them more shallow. More of them grow and they're easier to dig out next time if you're using the traditional propagation method. Nice. And do you know where I could trade for some or get some? Yeah, I have some for you. Oh, thank you. I'll be in Anchorage this Thursday and Friday for um, a meeting. Okay. Yeah, I've got little tiny seedlings. Oh, I will put my number in the chat if you can give me a call when you have yep. time. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you, Tia. I'm very happy. Yeah, that um, we were at Howard Luke Camp in on the Nana River. Uh, well, Lisa, you probably have heard of it. It's the Howard Luke's Culture Camp up the stream, and we were there with Native Movement and Ine Begine was coordinating, and I had them digging up. There was a whole bunch of in, musu or Indian potato. They call them tots. I mean, troth or soth there for their dialect. Um, but you could tell that it was a traditional plant because of where it was growing. How like dense it was and how hardy it was and so I had people digging them up and and we cleaned them and and cooked them and processed them and Luke Titus walks in because we were having a, a potluck 
And he walks in, and he says that he's like, now that's Indian food. I haven't seen that since I was a kid. Um, so, you know, like that's, it just triggers for our elders. And I, when I was in inland in Carcross teaching their Frank, who's from Carcross, he was talking about how, when they went to residential school, um, forced residential school, they weren't being fed enough food. And so the boys would go dig them up and break them up and hide them in their pockets. And then the kids would eat them throughout the day so that they weren't suffering from, from hunger pains. And so that they had enough, you know, calories in their belly. So it really is a, a vital plant to our culture and survival. And it's also the plant that the main campus of UF is now named after. It's Trathiera, that's Indian or Eskimo Potato Hill. So it is very important in the interior. Bita, you have a question in the chat. I have a bigger question from Emily Becker. How do we help bridge the knowledge gap about this in other places in Alaska? Uh, well, how do we bridge it? I I'm mean, talking about, just dedication. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was, you know, I, um, I was recently talking to a friend in Gulvin and she said, oh yeah, you know, we used to have really big gardens and I feel like um, some of this history is lost and, you know, so I'm curious how, how we can start reclaiming it or learning more about it. Um, engaging the local elders and community members and also supporting the youth. Um, it's it's awesome that like people want to learn about our traditional stuff, but as most of you know, a lot of American people are, are transient and they move around. Um, so it's cool that people learn about it, but if you're teaching the indigenous youth who are tied to land, tied to family, tied to community, then you're creating this impetus for sharing that knowledge uh, with their peers, their elders, and their future generations. Um, so while we should teach everybody and share, I, we need to emphasize getting the youth involved and growing things and empowering them with knowledge. Um, and that what I found with teaching around the state is, you know, some people call me an expert. I'm not really an expert. I'm just kind of okay at being a good facilitator and listening. Um, so when I go into a community, I bring what I have and share. And then my favorite is when we get to sit and listen, and you might have 15 people who say, oh, I don't know anything. But once they all start sharing their little bits of knowledge and information, you actually then have this big body of knowledge um, that you can fill in the gaps with, you know, Western science and data Um and then add in the traditional stewardship methods and you have a whole full book, a full story again. And I think that we're just really in a beautiful time right now where we're able to do that. Thank you so much. I think just looking at the time, we should use that as our closing moment. And I totally agree with you that teaching the youth and keeping the knowledge alive in the communities, this is what we need because this is where the knowledge belongs and that's what what grows, that's where the roots are. And we all we have to do is really support those roots and all we can do and help them grow and thrive. So thank you so much. Um, this was really a whirlwind express <laughs> webinar. Thank you for sharing your research, Kalina, on the silver weed. And I'm excited about your next project because I hope you'll be there next semester again. And thank you too, for Mina, for just putting together your presentation, sharing your knowledge and your worldview. It's always a pleasure to, to listen to you and to both of you. Thank you. And thank you all for attending.